You are listening to Eastman's Flycast, an adventure fly fishing specific podcast covering travel, tactics, and next level insight. Now your host, Brian Barney. Yo, what's happening guys? Got a brand new Eastman's Flycast for you. So on today's podcast, I have on a buddy, Justin Edge from Edge Outfitting. Justin Edge is, is located right here in the Madison Valley, and so that's how I got to meet him and got to know him, and he's just the perfect guest for the podcast. Uh, he's been published in the, the Eastman's Bow Hunting Journal for his bow hunting success. He loves to chase bulls come, come September, and he's really good at it, and, and he's also a really good fly fisherman. So he's got great insight into to fly fishing, into learning, into these different rivers. And so we just had this great conversation. Uh, we start off the first 10 minutes or so. We talk about the new regulations that they're trying to pass on the Madison. And, and really, I just use it as an opportunity to get Justin's insight on it, get his feelings on things. He's will, really well read and involved in this process. And so he kind of educates me up on what they're trying to do on the Madison and, and some of the scary proposals that they have. And so uh, that's what we start talking about. And then the next 50 minutes is all about uh, next level fly fishing. So thanks again to Justin to be on on. Uh, I really appreciate it. He's a great guest. I really enjoyed it. And I know you guys are going to enjoy it too. I just want to thank Eastman's for their support of the podcast. Make sure to check out everything we have going on over there at Eastman's. Uh, I have the 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 hunting specific podcast, Eastman's Elevated. Uh, this week I have a great guest, Lucas Pog. Uh, Lucas is one of those guys that's just consistently successful with a bow in his hands. Uh, he travels all over the United States and all over the. the the world really bow hunting and, and and it's extremely successful and so we had a great in-depth conversation so make sure to check that out over on Eastman's Elevated and and right now we're we're doing a, a huge giveaway for Tag Hub. Tag Hub is our internet research tool uh, and it really is a great program that we're improving and evolving all the time but it's to give you guys information about different states and different species uh, success odds, drawing odds, all the information to really educate you on these other states so you can take it, uh, take oppor- take advantage of the opportunity of being able to hunt out of state. So make sure to check that out. $16,000 worth of gear from Tag Hub we're giving away. Uh, there's bows in there and pistols and packs and about everything you can think of. So make sure to check that out. And with that, let's get into this podcast. So this is Justin Edge, Eastman's Flycast. I'm your host, Brian Barney. Here we go. Yeah, I thought about talking about that. And I know, you know, you've got a strong opinion about some of the rules and things Mm -hmm. that are being placed on the Madison. You know, I I didn't go to many of the meetings or anything, but the Madison does mean so much to me. Mm -hmm. Like, um, but I I would always read through your posts. And uh, Charlie always spoke highly of you, too. Um, just about your perspective on mm-hmm. things. So if there's anything you want to bring mm-hmm. up or talk about there, you know, without getting too far in the weeds, but yeah. just kind of stating what's going right. on or how people right. can help, I'd be happy to talk yeah. about that. Yeah, it's a hot topic currently. I mean, there's a big commission meeting this Friday. Is there? 9, 9 a.m., yeah. They're um, um, meeting to hear uh, FWP staff's um, draft environmental assessment uh, for the recreation management plan. And up for um, as an item on the agenda is whether or not the commission is going to vote to release that draft plan for public comment. So if the commission approves um, this EA to be released, it will go out for public comment for 30 to 60 days or or whatever the commission decides the length of time to be. Um, So that's the current. And then what do they do? Review the the comments after that 30 to 60 days and then figure out whether or not they're going to apply those rules by the comments they get? Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. So um, big um, changes, big changes on the menu. Um, And um, so we'll see what happens. Um, It's going to be really interesting. The, The whole COVID situation has sort of changed how these meetings are conducted. And so that's going to add a whole new wrinkle to it. Um, the meeting will be by Zoom. And even prior to where we are now, the previous meetings have been jam-packed, rooms packed. So it'll be really interesting to see how the meeting actually 
I mean, everybody's doing meetings these days by Zoom, right? But like when you've got potentially hundreds of people trying to log in and listen and then comment, um, man, I don't know how that's going to go, but that's it's going to be, be a mess. <laughs> yeah, I, there's, there's just several several layers of the whole thing on Friday that are going to be fascinating to watch. Um, so I don't whether or not we get a chance to actually comment during this meeting is, is who knows, but um, I just anticipate a lot of technical glitches and I don't know. We'll see. Man, we'll see, right? Yeah, I think it'd be good to talk about. You're so well-informed on the subject and can educate me on it a little bit, coming from an outfitter, coming from a sportsman, mm -hmm. right. coming from what they're they're trying to do, mm -hmm. what we should do, or what mm -hmm. you think sure. is the best. Like, sure. I think it'd be good to get into just with, you know, the, the podcast is mostly like uh, fly fishing mm -hmm. tactics and, yeah. and fun and things, but I think that's an important subject that we could spend 10, 15 right. minutes on, oh, at least sure. chat about, and you can educate yeah. me a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, promote edge outfitting for you. Anything else I can promote for you? No, that's it, man. Um, I'm, I'm largely, I'm largely on my own now, uh, for better or worse, but, um, and that has been mostly dictated by the Madison river recreation plan process. Um, always wanted to become my own outfitter, but with these impending regs coming it sort of sped up the desire to get that going forced you into it right you got to yeah. get those days under your belt so that yeah. you can guide throughout exactly. the summer right is that what is that your thought process essentially yeah, yeah. i mean is most river systems um, that have recreation management plans for commercial users are um, based somewhat uh, within the historical use framework um, so you have to have shown historical use in prior years um, to maintain your outfitter status on that river. Mm -hmm. um, in this particular river, we have uh, an SRP program, special recreation permit. So in addition to having an outfitter's license, you've got to have an SRP uh, permit. And um, so you have to show some sort of use uh, under that SRP tag. Um, and that's tough as a young outfitter, you know, it takes many many years to develop a client base of your own oh yeah uh, i mean uh, I've, I've had no problem getting days on the river from other outfitters historically but very few of those have been my own right so um that's what we've been working on lately a lot of marketing um but you just got to take the plunge at some point and just trust that you'll be able to get business whether it's last minute business or um, word of mouth and that's what it is mostly with with commercial um, with guiding and outfitting it is it's word of mouth so uh, someone has a good time on the river and they tell their friend or their brother or their cousin and and so you next thing you know you get a call and said hey my brother or my sister was out and so um, mostly that so we'll see how it goes so far it's been a great season even though we've got COVID um it's uh, gotten off to a better start than I was anticipating, so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm pretty hopeful I'll have a, a good year this year. So. Oh, good for you! Yeah. yeah, that's great. Like you say, being a young outfitter like that, um, yeah, you put in your days and built your name. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's it's scary to see like uh, all the regulations they're going to put on things. You know. It's yeah, it's tough. It's tough. Yeah, it's um makes those user days pretty valuable too. But it does. Yeah, you know. Yeah, tough deal. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what's right or wrong. They definitely right. have to regulate it at some point. It's gonna mm -hmm. hit that tipping point, and it's good to look at now before it gets to that tipping point. But there too, there's guys' livelihoods on the line, and some guys have been setting up for this for a long time, and other guys are just getting established, you know. And, right. and right. Um, so yeah, it is tough to dissect and to. to figure which way to yeah. which way of the fence which side of the fence i sit on but you know i just try to look out for everybody i guess mm -hmm. how it affects mm -hmm. me how it affects my buddies you know guides yeah. and outfitters and and uh listen to smart people like yourself that are really yeah. read up on it that <laughs> know what they're talking it's, about it's um it's a very complicated um situation that we're in um in the madison is a, is a unique river in that um, we've got roughly 57 miles of the upper river that um, we can float um, and 37 of those roughly are considered float water and so um, 
it makes it a very short river to operate as a f float angler uh, or commercial user with primarily float float angling. Um, so any regulations, you know, almost more than what concerns me more than anything really um, is from my standpoint as a as just a, a recreational sportsman uh, being able to access the river in certain stretches. Yes, um, that concerns me as much, if not more, um, than any impacts on my commercial uh, usability. Um, that's what woke me up too. Yeah, when yeah. I when I saw the mm -hmm. uh, when they had made the rules, they weren't even going to let you fish or even float through sections of water. That's crazy. Correct, correct. And so, right now, that's one of the items in FWP staff's preferred alternative. So, um, there are um, two sections of river that they're proposing to close down to um, fishing by access from boat. And those are um, Quake to Lions on one day, I believe it was Sunday, and then um, Ennis to Ennis Lake on Saturdays that you can't use a boat to access the river to fish. And that's sort of, um, I don't know, that's very concerning to me because both of those stretches of river are predominantly privately owned on either side, especially the Ennis to Ennis Lake. Uh, portion you've got uh, valley garden fishing access site um, but man the majority of that river is privately owned and so i'm not sure who that's serving right like who is that benefiting uh, or who is it intended to benefit because um, to me i view that as, as sort of a, a, an infringement on our public access absolutely in montana and um, I, I have a lot of concerns from a commercial standpoint but I don't know. I, I love that stretch of river, and, man, that's very concerning to me to not be able to use that piece of, of water to uh, to fish, even personally, um, even with just one day a week, right? Like, if we give an inch, what do we, you know, where does this road take us? Um, mm -hmm. Maybe it happens on the Yellowstone next or the Missouri or so. I feel like we have to sort of hold our ground on the public access here as much as we can. Set such a precedent for what can happen on right. not only this river, but other mm -hmm. rivers, other sections. Mm -hmm. So uh, you did such a good job of explaining that. Do you mind if we just get into it, Justin? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Yeah, so uh, Justin Edge, Edge Outfitting. Um, yeah, thanks a bunch for coming on. And so, yeah, you're so knowledgeable about what's going on on our Madison River right now. So you did a great job of explaining it. And you're right. Like they're trying to shut it down one day a week where you can only wade fish in. And it, it's, it's private the whole way, pretty much mm -hmm. besides the fishing access. But we have these water rights and these water rules that they pass. And part of that is if you can navigate a boat down it, you can float down it and you can access right. from a boat. To take that away, mm -hmm. I, I think, goes against Montana uh, the water rules yeah. that they've set forth, you right, know, so right. I, I just can't see how that's an option and where it even upsets me more, you know, even though I love that Ennis to the lake float and doing that, you know, they have the Valley Garden access, but, but the one up top is the one that really gets yeah. me because it's, it seems like it's a lot of people in that development that are pushing for privatizing right. fishing from their property there, and they want to pass a rule that nobody else can fish there no. but they can. And that's just not the way Montana was set up. And, th and I think it's it's being described as a conflict, right? Like that, that's sort of how it's described by, by FWP is there's all this conflict. There's conflict, conflict, conflict. Um, and I just wonder, is the conflict that that is being described just simply – seeing other people using boats fishing those stretches of water because I, I don't see any other documented, you know, cases of, of so much egregious conflict occurring that something like this is necessary. I just, it, it's concerning that like, you know, just, just someone seeing another boat out and that upsetting them floating by their property. Um, that's not conflict to me. Mm -hmm. That's, that's public access. That's our water. That's our resources. Um, no one owns that, you yep. know? And so, uh, but it's being trumped up as, as a conflict. Um, and I've really been trying to hammer down on FWP to really describe like what conflicts are actually occurring. Like, 
How are they occurring? Where are they occurring? Are they being reported and documented? And what have you done to address the conflicts that you allege have happened? And so just to sort of flush out, like exactly what are we talking about when we say conflict? Um, because that's the word that is being heavily used by FWP to justify these regulations. Um, and so um, that's sort of been one of the one of the items that I've been focused on lately. Mm hmm. No, uh, you're right. What is the conflict? I spend a lot of time on the water and I very rarely run into conflict with anybody. And I can consider myself, you know, a recreational fisherman. Um, but, but I also have a bunch of friends that are guides and outfitters and, and I just don't run into many problems on the river. It right. seems like everybody's in a good mood. Now there's, you know, there's some things like rigging up on the boat right, ramp sure. or there's some things there where people don't quite yeah. handle situations right or a guy pulls out in front of you, but usually it's by accident. Totally, it's not on totally. purpose trying to cut you off. And yeah, I'm yeah, fine yeah. with all oh, that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, it different. happens all the time yeah. on the river. You know, I'm, we're on, as guides and officers, we're on the river every day. And I see that stuff all the time. And 99% of the time, the guy or the gal rowing the boat or whatever it is doesn't even know what they just did, right? And so I don't get mad or upset. Mm -hmm. It's just, that's just, you know, it's it's an etiquette thing, but it also comes from experience and I'm not going to yell at a guy or get into an argument for someone for, for pulling out on me. You know, I just pull over, wait a couple of minutes and I got the river back to myself. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, uh, it's that I don't consider conflict that I consider an accident or inexperience. And mm -hmm. you just, you can't let that get to you. Right. Like, mm -hmm. are we, we're all out there to have a good time. And are, are we that upset at, at, other people out there also having a good time that we're going to get mad. Like, I don't get it. I, I, don't, I don't get, get it. it. Look around, you know, like the Madisons yeah. are beautiful. I mean, the wildlife is there. The fish are almost always friendly. I mean, I don't know. I'm just, everybody's I'm, having I'm in fun. a good mood. Yeah. yeah, you know? yeah. Like, I'm out That's there the having way a good time. I am too. Yep. So. I'm having a good time. It, it take a lot to bother me out yeah. there. You know, you're just, um, well, and I think that's part of it too. It's just taking in that entire mm -hmm. experience. We were talking earlier before we jumped down on the podcast, just about, you know, like some of your guide clients or people that don't see this day in, day out, like the perspective that they give us, mm -hmm. you know, that they mm -hmm. float down that river and, uh, you know, that's a once a year thing for them to see right. the mountains that way and to see right. the fish. And sometimes you won't even be catching fish or it's not even that good. Mm -hmm. And they're having the best day oh, of sure. their life, you know. Oh, and, sure. and so we have to realize that, too, you know, yep. a little perspective. And we try really hard not to take for granted what we have here because we are yeah. in a very special place on planet. Yeah, Earth. I try and take the pressure off people, too. Sometimes as a fishing guide, you know, you I can sense when I get someone in the boat and they want to fish, but that's not like they're not. They're not there just to fish, right? And so I will always ask people, look, y you don't have to fish all day, right? Like we're floating by the Palisades or we're floating in the flats and there's antelope around. I mean, you don't need to be staring at that dry fly or that bobber all day. Like just take a, take a minute, take 20 minutes and just float and enjoy, you know? I mean, and people appreciate that. It's, it's, um, they're like, oh, really? I don't, I don't have to you mean I don't have to fish all day? Like, no, <laughs> you know, <laughs> let's just have a good time. So now you'd have a hard time not getting me to fish every yeah, right. <laughs> second, but I have to remember to look up too because right. I get so focused. Well, like the fun of it yes. for me for hunting and fishing is I love immersing myself mm -hmm. in it, trying to to uh, uh, like solve the puzzle or you know figure out what's happening on the ridge. So I'm so focused on what it's going what's going on uh -huh. that that takes away from all my other problems. I'm yep. so immersed in yes. this fishing. Uh, so, so I love it that way, but in that same breath, I have to remember to pull over that boat, you know, mm -hmm. every 30 minutes or so, take in, look at the mountains, laugh with your buddy, yep. have a little snack, get out and fish. And, and also it just kind of resets the brain too. Mm -hmm. You know, you can get into this, this pattern where you're going down the river and maybe the fishing isn't red hot, you know, after the first 20 minutes, you're not throwing that thing as hard right. in the brush or as hard on the drift or getting the mends like you need it. You're not doing all those little things. Just pull yep. over, reset, have a laugh with your buddy, and then mm -hmm. go back out. But I have to remember to yep. look up and look at the mountain. Sometimes I get done with the whole day, and I think, you know, I, I stared at that yeah. dry fly all day long. Look I never at looked look at the mountain. Look what I missed. Yeah, so guy yeah. does have to take it in. Yeah, I went out a few, uh, a few weeks ago. We had a really good blue-wing olive day. Um, in fact, when you had Brian on, um, 
on one of one of his episodes he, he mentioned um everyone's out there looking for a unicorn fish but there's also unicorn days and man that really struck home with me because um as as a guide i think about the day right like i'm, I'm looking for that day that just has the right feeling um the right weather so much of it is weather oriented around here um and i was out on a on a cool cloudy day and there were fish rising to blueing olives like i'd never seen before and i had to just like pull over and i probably watched them for 20 minutes you know and finally got out caught one and then went back and just watched them. it was such a cool just yeah i mean there's 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 all the birds are showing back up the sand hills were out chirping grass was starting to get green there there's fish right i mean it was spectacular that's magic yeah, isn't it it's and so cool you just have to stop just yeah stop what uh, you're doing good for you you soaked it watch in watch it it's amazing because it will only happen a couple times you know for the spring for the blueing olive hedge like they don't only have a couple times so um just consider yourself lucky to be there when it did how um, cool justin yeah. yeah those days you go out so many days hoping for that day right. and and uh I'm the eternal optimist. I always right. think it's going to be a good day. But, you know, you may have five or ten yeah. days to see that one day. Or like you're talking mm -hmm. about, there's only, you know, the blue wing olive hatch isn't that giant on the mass. And there might only be one mm -hmm. or two days a year, mm -hmm. if that. So Everything to time it together, right, yeah. yeah, to time it right and see that, it's amazing. Yep. I just think that's so magical. Whether I'm I'm hunting or fishing, when I see it epic and it goes off yeah. like that, I feel like the luckiest person alive yep. just to be standing there, yep. just yep. to be here taking it all in. And it's like it, it's like public waters, mm -hmm. too. Everybody's out there. Everybody's looking for this amazing experience, and it just doesn't come easy. It comes with keep going out, keep trying to call the weather, keep trying to find it, yeah. and then eventually you hit that day like get, you did. You get a jackpot, magic. yeah. Yeah, we had a, we had a family uh, for Big Sky last week and uh a couple of boats and and we were out and there was an incredible march brown hatchet and all four mom dad and two sons had never touched a fly rod before and when we set out in the morning you know i just had that feeling like today th this it's all coming together like it, as long as we can get these people all you know to, we had to teach them to cast like they had never touched a fly and it all came together and the weather just worked out perfectly and it's so fun and nice when, when the people that you're taking fishing appreciate it as much as you do, you know, and, and so they just had a ball, man. They, I mean, it just, it was a unicorn day for them. It had for to be me, the it was funnest great. day of their oh, life. Was, oh I can't gosh. imagine learning how to fly fish awesome. and then seeing the best day of fly fishing. And at the end of the day, see. you're like, and you guys just like, I wish I had that introduction, like just the perfect day to start, you know, man. everything worked out for them. So that was, was a March Brown. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So I didn't get the March day. Browns good this year. Um, but boy, that river is clearing now. It's starting to look pretty green. Yeah, You've been fishing fast. the last couple of days, huh? Yep. It's dropping fast. Uh, yesterday up at $3 was really good. Noticeable difference in the flow up there and the color. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think Cabin Creek and Beaver Creek were both sort of calming down a little bit, probably still pushing a little mud, but the clarity is, is sort of improving uh, by the day and uh good day up there and um so yeah it's it's been uh it's been good going back out tomorrow so hopefully we'll keep the good mojo going yeah yeah, yeah keep the stoke high yeah, yeah i can't wait i gotta get back out there i i did the henry's fork i went down oh, there cool. through dry flies i think those green drakes are getting ready to come yep. off down there yep. where it goes off yep. down there I'd like to make another trip down oh that is fun but yeah, yeah. I, I was supposed to do the big hole sunday but um mm -hmm. I ended up, uh, well, I was going to go with Charlie, and yep. it didn't work out. But, uh, yeah, I ended up going over to the Ruby, and um, that thing was coming into shape, which was nice. They've got the dam, so it's controlled, but there's so much dark water that pours into that thing that lower mm. down by town. And it's just a small river, but it's like nobody drifts it. And it's yeah. like I can just go there with a the streamer, not see another human right. being, and I turn like six oh, fish. Oh, yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, it was good. Yeah, that's I, cool. The best fish I had on, I jumped him once. And then he jumped again when I got him close to shore and came off and came on button, oh, you nice. know, God, he was a good fish. <laughs> then had another one chase me down, like all the way down river, down yeah. the bank on my same side. And I, I pulled the fly right out of his face. <laughs> but, um, well, those, those things are tough. I miss so many fish streamer mm. fishing. 
like even double hooks, and I pinch all my barbs, but still, you know, if I can hook them good, I can usually get them. Mm. It's in those first few seconds where I lose them. Um, yeah. But but I'm so I'm trying to strip set harder on them. You gotcha. know, I'm trying yep, yep, yep. to really get that hook set when I'm stripping and I feel something to really set right. into it. You know, but uh, that time I I pulled my pulled the fly out of the water right out of the and then couldn't get him to eat it again you know but oh, man. God, it's just fun being out isn't it you know it? we i've had that same experience lately with with folks on the fire hole in the park which has been fishing amazing lately um how cool the fire hole in the park you go hike into that spot uh i usually will go not too far no above above midway geyser basin okay um and it's traditionally you know, the fire hole is a spot that is, is known for soft tackles and getting good, good dry fly fishing. Um, it's in the park, right? You drive yep, in there? Yep. yep okay. Yeah. So, so you hook a left at Madison Junction. Okay. I'm sorry, a right and, uh, at Madison Junction and um, go up past uh, Grand Prismatic Spring. Okay. And um, just some beautiful tea-colored water, the fire hole. And I love tea-colored yeah, water. Man, this time of year... You know, nobody streamer fishes that that river because it's so well known for its dry flies and soft tackles. But man, those fish are nuts for streamers there. And they, I'd say, eight out of ten casts, you're getting a chase. Like you could see oh, them chasing wow. it, right? How cool! There's and some big fish in there too. There is some big fish. There's a lot of small fish. Is a there? lot of small fish. Yeah, and but with the streamer, will bring out, will tease out the bigger ones. And um, but they chase it so much that it's you know you may only land one out of 20 chases right you may only get hooked up with one out of 20 but you're seeing them and and and, and i haven't quite figured out exactly what's going on but i think it's it's a it's just an aggressive you know follow and they bump it almost with their cheek it seems because you'll see a flash right before you feel a tug and there's you set the hook no matter how you can strip set you can you know trout set whatever you know, it's just you're either going to hook them or they're either eating it or they're just bumping it. But it's so much fun to see them chase it every time. It's so cool. So that's been fishing. And the gibbon does well this time of year, too, with that streamers, too. Um, but, uh, yeah, the park's a special place. That's my that's one of my favorite playgrounds around here. Good for you. Uh, You've just uh, immersed yourself in the ecosystem spot. around here. So where did yeah. you move here from, Justin? Uh, well, I grew up in Georgia, northwest Georgia. I grew okay. up fishing bass and and um, and, and bluegill. Um, but um, my background is in, in carnivore research. Um, did my, my undergraduate in Georgia and um, my master's in Michigan with wolves. That's right. Yeah, yeah. you keep inviting me to go bear hunting through my dad. Yeah. We haven't been able to connect go and go yet. Yeah, yeah someone's got to show me how to hunt one of those things. I just know how to find them. I don't really know how to hunt them, though. <laughs> man, those things are fun, for sure. Oh, man. So that's sort of um, – I've worked all over the country with carnivore um, on various carnivore projects. How and, cool. Um, and so that's what got me to the, the, the southwest Montana area about 15, 16 years ago. Okay. Um, where I worked as a wolf and, and coyote biologist in Yellowstone. And uh, so that's sort of how I got to know the park um, pretty pretty well and intimately um, and fished it just about every day that I could when I was working in the park. So, um, so yeah, that's how I ended up here. Gotcha. There's so many good places to go. Yeah. And even – even in today's day and age where there's so many guys looking to hit that good day or those good fish, there's just so many good places to fish. And the deal, like I mm -hmm. think about hunting or like I think about fishing, is you still have to choose one spot to go right. for the day. That's it. You can right. only be one know, spot right. per day, you yep. know. And so there's just all this water to go. Mm -hmm. and, and, and everything, like you talked about how uh, the Madison, the bite is, is weather dependent. Mm -hmm. There's all these conditions with flow and um, hatches, time of year, right. weather. Um, so, so you said that. The, the mm -hmm. day you saw this here was those cloudy, yeah. overcast, mm -hmm. cool days. Those those overcast days, you just can't beat them for the yeah. streamer bite, for the dry fly hatch, right. for the whole deal. There's just so few and far between in the Madison Valley. It's so like, much oh, sunshine. Man, it's so great to have a cool, cloudy day. It's going to be on today, you know, with no wind. So, yeah, that's – that's uh, you know, when you were talking to Brian in, that, in, in his episode, it, it, he mentioned, he's like, you know, I haven't fished the squala hatch in the northwest – since I've lived in Montana, and I heard that, and I thought, man, neither have I. You I know? know, like just spent all my time in the park and, and and on the Madison, the Jefferson, Big Hole, Beaverhead, all this this entire area. It's like I want to go up there, but just 
man, you get so um, educated on, on, on how to fish these rivers that you want to get even better at it. And um, so it's hard to, to pull yourself away to go learn a new system. Um, one of these days, though. It, it is because just because Southwest Montana is so great, like even the spots you fish, I fish different spots and we yeah. live in the same know, town. Right? We have right. uh, different favorite stretches mm-hmm. and, and different. So like there's so many different systems to fish and explore. And it's it's tough to go drive four hours to a different yeah, system yeah. when we have some of the best fishing right, by right, around the best us. right around us. Yeah, yeah. So it's tough to go for. But I'm with you that I caught a couple fish on Squala this year and. Um, it, it, I haven't seen it go off. Yeah. It was as good this year as I've ever seen it on that lower end. Seems yep. like there was a lot of squalas coming off. Um, I just didn't quite hit it on the right day where the fish were keyed into them. But I get uh, I got to get out to that western side or that northwest. Mm-hmm. I'm really sick to to fish for some bull trout. I've never right. caught one. Yep. I got to go up and yeah, pull some streamers for one. those yep. things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in the systems yeah. you can do it. Right. Right. Yeah. Oh, man. There's a lot of systems where you can't do it sure. or they don't yep. allow it, but there are systems where they allow it and it's really good off a streamer oh. and work like those rivers are so pretty too. They're like deep a whole glacial world fed there. rivers. Yeah. yeah. It's a whole different yep. world. It really is. So yeah. I, I need to do more of that too. Yeah. Yeah. Someday, someday take a tour up there. The sampler, the Northwest Montana sampler. Guys just got to plan it. Just yeah. plan a few days and go, Hey, I got this weekend. It, it's just so easy when we have free time. It's so fun to spend time with our family, to be around right. our house, to take care of yard work in the morning, and then we're on the river, whatever the case yep. is, you know. Yeah, it's so easy you, to just maximize the amount of time that you have available on a river that's five minutes away. You mm-hmm. know? That's a good point. That's that's how I look at it. And, uh, I mean, people will ask me, like, where, where, do you still fish? You know, do you still like to fish, even though you take people guiding every day? It's like, I love to fish, you know, and <laughs> – where do you go? I'm right here where we are, you know, like right here. I fish right here at eight mile or burnt tree or town. And, uh, those are the places that I go. I, and, um, I, my favorite thing to do now is, a, you know, is just to go down with a single fly. You know, I'll walk out in the river with, with one rod and one fly, most of the time a dry fly and, um, and just keep it simple. And that's, it just, everything is, is, is in slow motion when things are simple. And so, um, that's my favorite thing to do is go down with the big elk hair caddis. And if it's on, it's on. If it's not, no, well, you know, I go for a walk in the river. So, so fun, isn't it? Well, and I think as much as I love to travel and go on adventures and be gone here and, and you go on some mm-hmm. amazing adventures as well, as much as I like to travel, I think it's so important, important to take advantage of what's right around you, right. what's close, you know, and, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think we'd be fools not to be fishing oh, one of the greatest rivers around, or oh. we'd be fools not to be bear hunting in the hills right. or elk hunting or whatever the case we is. Just it's just so really good to right live around in this us. valley. I yeah. mean, it is just a, 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 the guy, a client I had today is like, man, this is really just a sportsman's paradise, isn't it? I'm like, yeah, this is, yeah, pretty much. You nailed it. Yeah. That's why we're all here. Man, yeah. just got to figure out how to make it work, and that's what we're all here to do. So, I like that single fly, that elk hair caddis. Yeah. The caddis start going off. Well, uh, I got it really good down on the lower section earlier this year, hiked way up uh-huh. in there and got it. Um, but those caddis start coming off now. Mm-hmm. It It's weird. Those caddis, there's different phases to a yeah. caddis, isn't there? Yeah. When they're on I the mean, water and when they're not, when they're mating, they're mm-hmm. just kind of buzzing around all the mm-hmm. bushes. And, and then right. they get to where... Is it dropping their eggs, or maybe you can tell me yeah, better, they're just Justin? Yeah, kind of fluttering on the surface, dropping eggs, and um, it, my, you know, what I like to do is that when it gets hot out in the summer, uh, you know, like mid July, that last hour of sunlight when the water temp is starting to cool off significantly, and that's really when I do the best with a, a, a big. And we're so lucky to have some big caddis around here on the Madison, you know, and, and you can, you can go fish a size 10 or 12 elk hair caddis. And I can see that thing a mile away, you know, and especially in this riffle, things aren't easy to see in the riffle in low light. Um, but man, when it gets hot out that last hour of sunlight, burn tree or eight miles, just go find a riffle and park it and, and, uh, and throw it out there. So we've got some some great caddis species around some big ones are going to be showing up here soon too so bigger darker ones yeah the big we we all call them the bomber caddis you know it's the big fat juicy ones so um those will be fun a lot of fun things coming up you know salmon flies will be soon um uh great uh, saw a lot of salmon flies in the park 
four days ago. So okay. uh, on the Madison, just below the junction. So that's oh, wow. always a, a that's coming. Yeah, it's a treat to see that there. You've got some hot water influence there that helps things speed along a little bit. But um, yeah, they're starting way up there now. So that's mm -hmm. cool. So that elk hair caddis, park in a riffle and throw out your elk hair caddis. Like fishing the, the Henry's Fork the mm -hmm. other day, I was fishing it with a buddy, Jared. And um, he does a lot of head hunting there on that oh, yeah. Henry's Fork. And so the head hunting is like um, looking for a rise yep. and seeing a rise. Now, oh, man, that's the, the best. See, I don't do much that's, of that. Yeah. Yeah. Usually I'm like, if they're not eating what I'm mm -hmm. throwing at them. You change it. it yeah but trying so, to figure out what they're yeah, yeah i haven't done much of mm -hmm. it i need to do more of it so mm -hmm. we were floating down the henry's fork and he saw a fish rise on the bank now if i see this on the madison yeah. i'm going by yeah, i right. was like i might put it in my mind right. but if i don't have a caddis tied on i'm not yeah. even going to throw it i'm going to keep going down looking for one off my streamer my mm -hmm. salmon fly he stops he the parked boat, to bra hit the brakes stop the boat yeah. and we sat there for 10 minutes yeah. and we watched that fish feed and yeah. it was sitting so tucked into this rock and we watched it just feed on this caddis and it was a really cool experience for me because i don't do that very right. often like most of the time you know if it doesn't eat my bug i keep going and uh, i definitely pay attention to rises that tells me what they're eating most of the time i can tell oh he ate a caddis oh he ate this mm -hmm. or ate that but we pulled over he knew it was a good fish and we just waited on it yeah waited and watched that fish ate and then i could see him and it was a nice brown you know yep. As and, I, um, yeah that is my favorite thing to do. Oh my gosh. Find one fish. I don't care if it's a six inch trout. All right. I just want to find that one. And, and that's sort of like the, the hunter in me, you know, I, I just want to, I want to stalk that thing, you know? And so you that play is, that same game. Yeah. You'll see a fish rise. Mm hmm. And then you'll wait, watch that fish rise, try to see which line he's exactly, in, yeah. where he's eating yep. bugs. And sometimes they're moving in the line. They'll That's slide right. out and they'll eat. Or right. sometimes they'll slide forward and eat and mm -hmm. then come back or they'll have like a circuit they run. Right. And so you're like dialing into what that fish is doing. pattern it. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And then that, that one that Jared caught, like I watched it eat and I was thinking, oh, a caddis eater. What? Okay, we'll sit here and watch this. It was really cool. Come up and eat. Yeah. And it looked like a decent, looked like a 16-inch yeah. fish. He looked onto that thing. It had this huge male head on Like, it was a really nice 19, 20-inch you know, fish. Some of those eats are so deceiving. You're like, oh, that looks like a decent fish. And then all of a sudden, boom, you connect with it, and it's a slab. That's always fun. Yeah. There's good pods of fish in the Madison. Mm -hmm. It seems like if you can see one eating or a couple eating out in a riffle, like yep. you're saying – and it can be in four yeah. inches of water or right. it can be in a two feet of water. Usually it's in a pretty fishy spot, mm -hmm. but it, it's not always the A spot. Mm -hmm. But then you just catch a couple feeding and then you start tossing and then, you know, you'll pick three, four, yeah. five out of that pod. Yeah. That's really fun. But I really thought that head hunting was was pretty cool idea. So um, it's tough to tell the size of the trout. It seems like those bigger trout almost sip it more than explode right. on it, don't right. they? Right. Yeah. And sometimes you'll you'll be able to see the disturbance of the tail behind the head. Oh, right? like, there you go. Like when I'm looking for when I've seen those fish rising consistently, I start looking not at the rise form but back behind them just to see what sort of disturbance is there. Oh, you're spot and on. So if I see something like just even if it's just a little bit of a wave that's created like fifteen, sixteen inches behind that, I'm like, Oh, okay. Now we got something, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so I want to be really careful about what I do with that one and how I approach it. But I love feeding, feeding the fly downstream, you know. Um, and that's one of the things that uh, there's a lot of great guides around here that have been here a while. Brian B Dog's one of them, you know. Is 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 he's the master of the dry fly fishing, and um, just watching him take people fishing and teach people how to present a fly to to a rising fish downstream, downstream, downstream. I mean, I can hear him across the river right now, you know, yelling at downstream cast. So um, that's my favorite way to approach uh, a rising fish, um, to take that line out of the equation, right? Like to not have to worry about drag and to feed it to him first. Um, so you're talking fishing above and then yeah. casting downstream, mm -hmm. fishing it to that, that yeah, fish. Yeah, quartering, sort of at a quartering yeah. angle downstream to him. Um, um that it's way tough because yeah. the quartering upstream works pretty good too yeah exactly yeah, yeah. Yep. yep yep so um gosh yeah. it, it is i love feeding to uh, i love trying to feed my fly to a to a feeding fish like that it seems like 
the presentation has to be spot on. And mm-hmm. in every place in that river is different. Mm-hmm. Every reed, every spot that you got to throw that fly to reach that fish is right. different. The current grabs it different. Maybe you got more current on yep. your side. Maybe you yep. got less. Maybe a, you got a pillow of water or a rock yeah. that you got to shoot over. So it's just trying to read that water. And mm-hmm. I like to, like, if I, if I see a rising trout or I want to hit a spot, I'll almost practice that cast short. I'll yep. throw that yeah, exactly. cast short, your, and I'll get yeah, some yeah, practice, yeah. and I'll see how that thing's drifting. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, okay, that thing's feeling good. I'm going to stick right. it right in its house. And then right. you stick it in there, and mm-hmm. then that water, that drift is the same as that practice drift you just run. That cast is the same as a practice cast, yep. and it seems like you can get yeah, a, a I mean, good drift out of it. On walkway trips, especially in the park, like on the fire hole or something, when we're, we're seeing rising fish, I'll have, I'll have people you know, cast in the opposite direction you know, away from that fish, get that distance out. And then they're, they're like sort of cocked and ready to go for that perfect distance. And one of the things that I've sort of been doing the last couple of, uh, of years with, with dry flies, especially on the mass, when you've got that constant riffle, um, sometimes it can, I feel like it can be hard for fish to discern your fly from all the others. And so I'll have people right before it gets to where that fish is rising, just give it a slight mend, sort of like just jump that fly a little bit on the water and get grab their attention and and so that has been working for me quite a bit like on the fire hole right now you know with pmds um there's so many pmds and so you know it's it's almost by just chance you know are they going to eat yours or the or the 50 others that are around it and so before right before it gets to where i feel like they're holding i'll have them mend it to put just a little bit of drag on that fly which is sort of counterintuitive but just like oh look at that one you know um and uh so that's been working quite a bit too but um, that's smart i really like that justin yeah it's sort of like it, you don't want drag right you people don't. are saying don't get don't no drag no drag but like just a little bit like just like oh Oh, well, that thing moved, you know? It's kind of like uh, moving your fly on the surface. Like, mm-hmm. if you're fishing a salmon fly, like, you don't have to throw them in. Like, maybe even just yep. skating it a little bit and getting it to move, yep. like, uh, it induces that bite. Yeah, where exactly, it just, yep. like, a, that predatory instinct, yours sticks out. I really yep, like that. Yep. And that's smart the because when they're throwing their men, they're setting up their line right, and it's just going to pull that fly a little bit. Like, a perfect man that shouldn't move the fly mm-hmm. a bit, but right. you know every right. man, you, it's going to – skate that fly just a yep. little bit yep. and then that's what's turning those and fish same on thing with uh nymphing this time of year like when the water is dirty um you know we're fishing a lot of girdle bugs and worms right and so um it could be hard for those fish to see very far and so when people are mending you know a lot of times they'll say oh, I'm, I'm i'm sorry i'm sorry i mended and moved my bobber i'm like no move that thing like jump that worm around down there and i feel like it is you know, led to uh, more hookups that mm-hmm. way, like grab their attention. Cause I don't think they can see that far when that's, I mean, a couple, what was like last week that the river was like a yoo drink, you know? Um, so any little movement that can set your fly apart or grab their attention. I mean, it's such a fast river. They've got to make a decision like right now, mm-hmm. you know? Um, so we're very, we're really lucky to have that as a characteristic of the Madison. I feel um, it helps with, with beginner fishermen you know i mean it just takes some of the technicality out of it Mm -hmm. well and i found um like in the past when i'm trying to to fish like say i'm head hunting which i saw a fish rise i know where it's at you know i used to throw my fly upstream and then i try to stack my line get a good mend on Mm -hmm. it so it's just going to dead drift right by him i've almost found that just like you're skating a fly before it gets to the fish if you can land that fly oh, right close on, to that fish right like oh of yeah it right seems like that them. same predatory instinct where yep. they got to come up and hit it gosh we had a fish that, that we casted a, a, um, a streamer on the fire hole last, last week and the splash had not even ended from the fly and the thing hit it you know and i'm just thinking man you must have hit that thing right on the nose you know and it just was so pissed off that it had to eat it so absolutely yeah and I, I, when people are casting big streamers um you know, I, I will often tell, like, let's splat, like, make a make them make it well known that your fly is there. You know, especially within that foot of range of the of the bank, um, grab their attention um, because a lot of times they're kind of tucked under that bank, and and um, if you put it loud enough on top of them, they're going to come out and check out, see what that was. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I find that too with streamers. 
you get so many eats right when they hit it, right yep. when they, it hits the water, just like you're saying on that mm-hmm. fire hole. Mm-hmm. Right as soon as it hits the water, it makes this huge splash. It looks like you threw a rock, and yep. that fish just smashes mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. It just disturbs all that water next to him, and they pick up that fly. And the same that thing too. with salmon flies, you know, early in the morning on the banks like that. Just splash that. I want – give me some sort of impact. I want to see that thing splash. Mm-hmm. Um, man, that's so much fun. I can't wait. It's coming up soon. It is. Well, um, I'm always so impressed um, with your lake fishing. You know that Ennis Lake, I think, as good or better than anybody. It seems like every time I'm down there, I see your truck and trailer <laughs> down there. Uh, but you kill it down there. You do so good. It's like a lot it's, of fun. it's not. It's a good fishery. It's not an easy fishery, though. So right. you're really dialed into the process of fishing that lake. So. Um, most of the time, are you targeting um, dry fly hatches in the mm-hmm. morning when it's calm out there throughout the summer? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the Madison's got, you know, it was dammed up by all the channels. I mean, if you th- look at an aerial imagery of the, of the channels and all those rivers that are, that you know, used to flow through that meadow, meadow lake, right? The old timers called meadow lake. Um, and there is a lot of deep channels in the lake spread out all over. And oh, so there's, wow. there's a lot of wrinkles uh, underneath the surface that um, um, there's a very short window of time to be able to see those channels. Like right now it's, it's, um, you know, it's murky, right? So you can't really see the terrain. And then as soon as it clears up, you get that moss come up. It's a, it's a blanket of moss on that south end especially. And so there's about a month of time there where you can really see terrain before the weeds come up and hide it all. Um, and so it's been a lot of, you know, paying your dues out there for me, um, finding out where, where some springs are and um, um, just a lot of trial and error um, um, to uh, find out where fish like to hold. But, yeah, they calm anything on any still water. It's all about the calm stuff you got to have calm winds any little chop is going to kill things um right now we just we're starting to see some pmds on on ennis lake and some others like other lakes that's a great hatch um a mid mid morning deal which is thankfully when we have our calmest weather you know for fishing around here typically is in 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 the morning um so uh yeah it's been a lot of trial and error there's a like i said there's a lot of moss on on the lake so Oftentimes, you just got to find those pockets of open water. And it, it may only be, you know, a four foot by four foot area, but there's going to be an island. I call it little islands of open water. And I'll focus on, on those once the summer weeds get up. Wow. Um, yeah, it is just paying your dues and experience out there. And you've definitely done that. So, okay. So, so you've, lo- you've learned the topography off the lake and not by watching your radar because Ennis Lake right. is so shallow. Mm-hmm. And so you're just cruising around the lake and all of a sudden you're finding fish and then you're seeing these, these deep channels in there and, and you're, you're paying attention to where you see those deep channels because that's where fish are going to hang. And then islands without weeds. So it's like right. open, open water. And this is later into the summer. You're right. seeing this open water without any weeds. And that's where those fish are feeding a lot at. Yeah. So, well, that's where you could spot them, right? Like I, I like to do sight casting. So, um, you know, people say, well, you know, where, where do you go? I and mean, it's like, you could just, you could row literally anywhere out in the middle of the lake. Um, and, and I will see people chase those rising fish and they're chasing them. They're like, Oh, there's one over there, hundred yards away. Let's row over there. And they get over there and they wait there and they're looking around. They're like, Oh, it's over there now. So man, just like row out, pick a spot anywhere, find an open, you know, segment of, uh, of water where there, where there's weeds around. And, and if you just park the boat, man, the fish will start coming to you. They'll start rising. There's, there's bugs everywhere on Ennis Lake, you know. And so um, I think people chase fish too much. Mm-hmm. Um, it's I've like been the guilty patient, of it, for it's sure. It's the patience thing. you got to yeah. just go find a spot and wait, you know. Um, that's uh, that's At least that's how I, I operate. I'll find a bigger island and, and uh, see them cruising, and whether it's Calabatus or PMDs or – whatever blueing olives uh, are you seeing the fish under the surface yeah. as well yeah oh yeah. cool just kind that's of a fun way it. to fish you know and in the fall with streamers it's always fun to grab their attention when you spot them coming out you gotta have people that are ready to you know quickly cast it's like fish in the salt you mm. get one chance to make one cast and a lot of, of times man you hook those things and they go back in the weeds and you're done really so um but 
it is what it is. It's always fun to hook them up. You don't always land them because they know they know where to go, mm-hmm. right? So there's some really nice fish that you catch out of that Ennis Lake. Is there some next level fish that live in that thing? Oh yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Uh, there was a guy actually I saw. It's been a few years ago now, but he was actually stripping just a, like a small pheasant tail, and uh, he landed this thing. And I didn't get to see the fish up close, but he 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 had to tell someone about this fish. It was I could tell from a distance. Like, <laughs> he wanted to row over and show yeah, you. Yeah, I'm, like, I'm like, dang, that thing. I don't know, man. That looked like a big fish, yeah. you know. And and he was so jacked up about it. And I was the first person that he could <laughs> come talk to. And he showed me a picture of this fish. It had to be 30 inches. Oh my god! I mean, this thing was a monster. And he oh. caught it like you know, it's like a size 14 pheasant tail you know just stripping it in some open water somewhere so out in the middle of the lake so yeah i think i think so um man that lake it, it just holds the biggest fish doesn't yeah, it it's, like it's I've, so I've caught all my biggest fish like coming out of lakes and i really need to focus on my still water game more i've definitely fished it more in the last handful of years but boy you can just you can sure turn up some really good fishing and some really good fish in those still waters and they can just grow so yeah. big yeah, it's an intimidating place, though. You know, you on a river, you you know, you get to be pretty good about reading water. Like, oh, that looks like a good spot where there's soft seam. Um, it's got like a nervous look to it. But on a lake, everything looks the same. And so, you know, initially, it's a very intimidating feeling. Like, where do you even start? You know, and um, just pick a place and start there, and trial and error. But um, eventually you get pretty addicted to it because you'll see these things occasionally these big ones that just dart through an open piece of water like the size of your area rug here and you're like oh my god where'd that thing go where'd he come from what's he doing you know um and once you see one of those fish man then you're hooked you got to figure out how to get them i like that sight fishing tim too because i i love sight fishing in those lakes yeah. that's my favorite it's being able to see them and then throw to them reminds me of like fishing the flats and mm-hmm. things you know mm-hmm. i just love that but yeah i, I didn't know uh i it's such a great technique you're using out there at ennis lake yeah i can see why you do really good it's out a there. different still water technique on a shallow lake like ennis you know i mean like charlie's so good charlie gordy's so good at you know like up in hebgen that deep coronamid rig i mean I mean, sometimes those things are down 15, 20 feet, you know, with the slip bobbers. Uh, but, you know, the average depth of Venice Lake in June or, well, July or August may only be on that south half, I don't know, a few feet, you mm-hmm. know, or a foot. And it's covered in weeds, so you can't really do that there. And so um, it's a completely different ball game um, on, on the local lake, yeah. <laughs> it's just each body of water – uh, it's got its own patterns and it's got its own yeah. it's got its own beat that you kind of got to get in tune with and figure yeah. out, doesn't it? Yeah. Just every every system that you fish, you're right. You get so comfortable on rivers, reading water and fishing high probability spots. Mm-hmm. But uh, starting off on a lake, it is it is so so big and intimidating. But I like mm-hmm. that sight fishing for yeah, those the, things. Yeah, you know the, the 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 lake will have you you can see some some. Uh, you can re- you'll learn to read the lake a little bit by the surface as well too you know those oh, yeah, yeah. those channels carry a long way out into the lake um and you'll be able to see where there's even just a little current like even it, literally in the middle of the lake you'll find a current in one section and and mostly calm water on the other and you can tell by glassiness you know it's calm there but then you look over there's a slight little nervous look and you look up and you're like, damn, I'm like a, a mile from the outlet, you know, but there's still current there. And um, so a lot of times you'll find fish in those in those open water segments in those currents, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, Do you anchor so up out there in those spots that you find? I like to use the wind. I'll just use the wind and, and drift uh, it and drift it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and it just keeps putting me in front of new new islands of open water. Um so I'll do that unless there's an active hatch going with mm-hmm. rising fish on a big island of open water, and then I'll, I'll anchor up there. But, uh, yeah, I like to use the wind to help keep my rigs uh, moving a little bit, you mm-hmm. know, especially before the weeds come up. Those, um, um, what are they, those giant midge or those uh, uh, chronomids or the – chron- Yeah, chronomids. Yeah, God, those giant midge are always coming off on yep. the lake. Do you have a good pattern you use for those? Um, 
I've got a couple that I use that are that I've just tied myself. They're mostly like a red and black, like a size twelve. Oh, they're big, you know, twelve. They are big. Yeah. And um, um, but I use you know coronamids, pheasant tails. I mean, your your super standard fare, hares ears. Um, you know, there's really no. So you're fishing those ones subsurface. So a lot of times, right. if you're not seeing rising trout, mm -hmm. then you'll fish yes. like a nymphric exactly. out there. So mm -hmm. if you don't see rising trout, you're still going to fish those islands of water in the calm, but nothing's coming up. You can see it. So then you're going to fish your pheasant tails right. or your hare's ears. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. And then yep. uh, how deep? Of leeches. And That's right. I got some good leech patterns. You know, like an olive leech pattern with a pheasant tail is probably my... One of my go-to standard operating procedure rigs for the Madison. Like if there's nothing really going on, on the surface, I got I got a, a leech pattern and a pheasant tail. Do you fish a balanced leech, or do you fish you a know, head tied leech? I haven't fished too many of those, but I'm I might try. Um, that's sort of on my next experimental list for the my, lake. Mine yeah. too. I haven't yeah. fished them, but I've heard those balanced leeches. Lots leeches of good things about that. Fish really yeah. good. Yeah, I watched Charlie catch a bunch off a of balanced leech. Is that leech. right? Yeah, 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 I was like, oh, God, I got to get some yeah. of those. Well, I mean, we're starting to use more of those jig-style jig, jig style patterns um, on the mass and even with nymphs, uh, the tungsten jigs, you know, where the hook rides up. Um, so it makes sense to try something like that, the balanced leech on the lake, yeah. Hmm. Um, mm -hmm. Crazy. Justin, so much fun. An yeah. hour has already gone by. Yeah. <laughs> As, dude, it's just an awesome conversation. You're so knowledgeable about the, the ecosystems around here. So thanks so much for coming yeah, on, Yeah, you man. bet. Thanks for having me on. It was awesome. It's a great conversation. Yeah, great conversation. I learned a ton. It's going to help my fishing yeah. for sure. So I really appreciate it. Uh, where can guys get a hold of you at? Uh, my website, uh, edgeoutfitting.com, Instagram. Facebook, Edge Out, everything's edgeoutfitting.com. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, you run a great social media too. Oh, thanks. I really enjoy yeah. it. Yeah, we try and stay active um, and uh, just show people having a good time, you know, whether it's it's, it's scenic floats or, or fishing. You mm -hmm. know? Well, you're really good at it. Thank you, sir. Appreciate Thank you. it. Okay. Yeah. All right, guys. It's a wrap. Yeah, Justin's extremely knowledgeable. Um, again, I just love this this platform of podcasting, these long-form conversations. You just get so much information out of them. So these guys, one by one, are making me a better uh, fly fisherman, and uh, I, I truly love it. So um, we got some great episodes coming up for you. I've actually got a couple days of fishing coming up. Super stoked. Uh, been so busy here lately. I got that those couple good days on the big hole fishing the salmon fly, and um, then I've kind of been missing in action. I got, I got out a couple days last week before the summit, a couple evenings after work, and... Um, I got worked, got my butt kicked. God, I hit the, the, the first spot I hit, let's see, I fished it. First spot I hit, I was a little low on the hatch. There were some bugs around, but they weren't really flying. Saw a lot of shucks and, and a trout definitely could have eat it there, eaten it there, but he, he decided not to. So I walked a few miles of bank line from one access to the next. Then the next day, went a little bit higher, put myself right in the hatch. They're flying. They're buzzing everywhere. They're landing on the water. I thought, this is it. I got like a couple eats working these back channels and things, but that was it. They just weren't on fire. So I don't know if the boat pressure that morning put them down or maybe it was just middle of the day or if they were gorged on salmon flies. So I had to run back to the house, I think do like a conference call, and then back out that evening, went higher on the hatch, tried to get in front of it, and uh, struck out. There was no bugs. Couldn't get them to eat. So just got my butt kicked, and then I had to go to the Western Summit. So I'm just dying to get some good fishing here and hit it right. But that's the way fly fishing is. You know, you got to put in quite a few mediocre days before you get those really good ones. Um, so Dylan Ness, he was our, our most popular podcast on Flycast. He's coming up for a couple days to fish with me and throw the big bug, uh, so I'm really looking forward to. It. I got to pour some concrete Thursday, and then we're going to get out after that. So uh, I'll also get him back on the podcast, and he's got a great Eastman's Elevated podcast coming up, all about spotting and stocking elk. So um, that'll be a fun one. Uh, I really appreciate the support and the downloads, you guys. Trying to make this podcast go, so the shares really help out, and uh, just. Um, the positivity. So uh, thanks a bunch, you guys. I appreciate it. I'll check in with you next week.